Aloha, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Kuntz. I am a professor at the Daniel K. Inouye Center for Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies here in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, today, we are coming together for another in our series on disinformation. Um, for, uh, we're doing a series of podcasts and webinars, and uh, we are doing this because, uh, as you know, we're going through a global pandemic, and we are in the midst of what's called the infodemic for COVID. So we're trying to get as much information out to our network of fellows and alumni and stakeholders so that we can educate, connect, and empower people so that they are armed with the best information so that we can all work together to fight this global pandemic and, and be more effective in the response and save lives. So today we are bringing together um, myself, uh, my colleague who is our expert in public affairs and, and information, disinformation and, and um, an expert from Internews, which is, is the group that we're going to talk today. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague so she can introduce herself. Hello, my name is Mary Markovinovich. I'm the Chief of Public Affairs at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. And um, I have been working in this area of disinformation and misinformation for a number of years. We have a lot of alumni who are, who are looking at not only the strategic impact, but how are ways that we can help them uh, fight this disinformation um, at all different levels of society. And so that's why we're really excited to have folks from Internews with us today. So I'm going to pass this on to Megan now for an introduction. Hi, hey everyone. My name is Megan Reinard Geil. Um, I'm the humanitarian director at Internews. I've worked for the past seven to eight years in the humanitarian development sector, focusing specifically on communicating with communities, making sure that people have accessible feedback loops and ways to communicate with uh, humanitarian actors and other stakeholders uh, in times of crisis and conflict. And over the last couple of years, I've been focusing specifically on looking at online to offline pathways to harm uh, as related to weaponization of information or to rumors and mis and disinformation. Um, and so, yeah, we at Internews focus especially on how to create healthy information ecosystems and environments. Um, I focus specifically on the humanitarian sector in that area, so making sure that the populations facing crisis have access to information and also have access to a way to express their feelings and needs. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank Megan. you for being here, Megan. Oh, go ahead, Mary. <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, you, you bring up a really great point in your introduction on uh, the information ecosystem. And right now, over, over the number of years, we've seen a decline in um, media that is supported by their local community. Um, a lot of small newspapers shutting down, radio stations shutting down, conglomerates buying them up. Some just going completely out of business and being replaced by um, bloggers and vloggers that have no accountability. Um, what are some of the ways that we can go to um, either for the media or for humanitarian assistance organizations, how we can build capacity to provide trustworthy information to the people? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think especially in the times of COVID, it's uh, more, it's becoming increasingly relevant um, for local and contextually specific uh, and accurate information to be shared with communities. And at the same time, we do also see a decline in support for local media organizations, particular particularly smaller organizations that are serving marginalized or vulnerable groups. Um, so like women's journalism groups, et cetera. Uh, so a couple of the biggest challenges that we're seeing right now, um, you mentioned one is sustainability. So Internews works very hard to make sure that we're, when we're working with local partners, um, we're also helping them to understand economic models that will help them to continue their work. So whether that's changing their workflows, changing their advertising structures, changing how they, just how they operate, um, we will work with them to help sort of upskill in that area. Um, we also can provide small grants, which can in sometimes, uh, in some cases, help to start a new journalism organization or help to continue one. Um, in terms of some other challenges that we're seeing, I think rumors and mis- and disinformation has been creeping to the fore <laughs> over the last several years. And again, because of COVID, we are now seeing it even on our front doors come to a higher level of relevance than, in, than before, perhaps. And so we work with local organizations, both humanitarian health actors and local media organizations to help them understand how do you appropriately track rumors and mis- and, mis and disinformation? And then how do you also appropriately report on that and share accurate information? So um, it's definitely not as simple as just 
always providing the accurate answer. You know, you need to understand the contextual influences that are making certain rumors take, take hold. Um, and so we really try to make sure that we're understanding those ecosystems appropriately. Um, I think another big one that we're seeing now, particularly, is how to report on health, um, health challenges. So we're really working with local actors, um, again, to make sure that not only are they understanding how to track the rumors and the mis and disinformation that are, that's traveling around about COVID, but also then how do you accurately report on um, treatment for COVID, uh, COVID symptoms, um, how do you dispel any politicization or stigmatization that may be coming up within communities around COVID. Um, and so we're also really, we've, we've pulled together several uh, health journalism ex experts to help our field teams and our local partners um, to, to tackle that. Um, and I think a sort of subtopic of that is how to also deal with data. So data journalism is another really big one that we're working to upskill our local partners on and provide good resources to for, for that. So properly um, gathering data, but then properly also interpreting large quantitative data sets and statistical analyses. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Mary, do you have any uh, additional follow-on questions? On this? I do, but I think she did a great transition to your question about the rumor tracking. <laughs> okay, well, well, so, that's it. That's, so yes, so the, the, one of the reasons I came to you is I, I met one of my dear friends from grad school 20 years ago, uh, used to work with Internews, so I've been a fan in tracking your work for quite a while um, in, the, in the capacity building. And the mission is so important. It's incredibly important because it is it's uh, the amount of information that people are inundated with on a daily basis with the advent and, and growth of social media and the percentage that people get from social media. It, everything's pivoting. And what Mary's saying is that, too, is this rise in, in in these in, in repressive kind of government where they're they're silencing media right and the quality of media to the integrity and, and ethics of media there's all these there's all these trends that are very dangerous and as a humanitarian director and coming from a humanitarian background some of the most vulnerable people who will end up in, in being uh, hurt the most are, are the folks that are at the in the position that are receiving humanitarian assistance so um, the fact that you have established this rumor tracking methodology, and and just from it was, it was 2013 for Dan, I bring this up every every I think, <laughs> but the fact that people are being murdered, humanitarian actors are being murdered because of some of these rumors, um, and, and whether it's coming from the media, um, you've had you had the WhatsApp, these group of kidnappers in India where these men were basically taken over and and and, and assaulted, and I think one of them was killed. And then you had the eight humanitarian workers that were killed in Nigeria and they shut down the vaccination campaign because all of the rumors associated with the vaccine campaign. And then we just recently had with the Gates Foundation who are the people that are poning up and like really working on this, on this global pandemic. And there's all these rumors associated with, that could really um, have such a negative effect that resulting in people re re rejecting treatment assistance but also putting humanitarian actors and public health actors in harm's way where they could be targeted because they're, the rumors are saying that they're there uh, they're to harm people. So uh, this, this, this methodology, these two, two, two guidebooks that you guys have, could you talk more about it, give some case studies and, and really uh, tell us how you've, it, you've implemented that on the ground? You're in a hundred countries, you guys have been around <laughs> 35 years. You guys are, are some of the, <laughs> folks that really have the biggest body of work in this. So you could go tell us about that. Yeah, sure. Um, as you mentioned, we've certainly got practice. Uh, so, the, but the world keeps giving us plenty of <laughs> lessons to learn and new experiences. Uh, and, and I think being aware of kind of the operational security risks and dangers that are arising because of the weaponization of information on digital platforms is, is a big one that um, I was tracking before I joined Internews and now we're obviously, <laughs> that's our bread and butter. We're paying attention to it very closely. Um, so the rumor tracking methodology, I think is just really key because it's not only understanding, it's not only as simple as tracking rumors, it's, it's really understanding the whole information ecosystem and environment. And, so, you know, why, why are rumors important? Um, I think it's a gateway to understanding the community that you're working in. So uh, information can save lives, information can end lives. If you're working in an information poor environment, that doesn't mean that you don't have to stop making decisions for yourself and for your family. And so people are able to make better decisions when they have access to good information, but they will make decisions whether they have access to that good information or not. 
Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons that rumors become so important because it helps us when we land on the ground to understand immediately what is the health of that information environment that people are having to operate in and make those decisions in. Um, I think a really good example of this was uh, in Turkey and during the, the, um, the Mediterranean response for the Syrian refugees, uh, there were several Facebook sites where smugglers were promoting themselves as um, travel agents for, for Syrian refugees to travel across the Mediterranean. And, uh, you know, they would even have shops. <laughs> so I would walk down a street in Turkey and you would see a travel, you know, a, a travel agency that was definitely not a travel agency. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, this, but if you're desperate and you've been traveling for weeks and months, you're just that much more vulnerable to that type of mis and disinformation. Um, and so understanding the rumors and tracking some of that information that, you know, you see on Facebook pages, you see on Twitter feeds, you see in WhatsApp groups, that immediately gives you an idea of what are the danger points for me as a humanitarian actor, but also and somewhat more importantly for the communities that we're operating in, what can we address right away? Um, they can also indicate hyper-local needs. So needs assessments are often done rapidly. They are often done uh, incompletely because they're focused on particular types of aid that are required. And so if we start to look at rumors, um, we can immediately see what the gaps are um, at that local community level and for those particularly vulnerable or marginalized groups. Um, we can also better understand fears, motivations, um, stigmatization or conflict dynamics, so we can have a very nuanced feel for what's happening within those communities. Um, it can also be an unofficial feedback mechanism. So if rumors are, are traveling around an aid response, you immediately know where your gaps are and how you're communicating. Um, so a really good example of this, I think, is the, the DRC Ebola response. Um, you know, there rumors about health and aid workers were traveling like wildfire on, uh, on WhatsApp groups that were private. So of course, very difficult to track, but um, health and aid workers were immediately politicized. They were aligned with different ethnic groups or you know, it was claimed that they were aligned with different, different ethnic groups. And um, so again, being aware of that and kind of being able to track it ahead of time would have helped us to be ahead of the curve and try to promote you know, accurate information about what the health and aid workers were doing in those communities. Um, and they do, I mean, we have implemented that in DRC now, but in the beginning, I do remember that it was a, a huge need. Um, Megan, can I ask you, you know, we yeah. have a lot of alumni that, um, some of them are government officials that might be working in disaster uh, response and humanitarian assistance. We do have some organizations that are alumni, uh, you know, humanitarian as associations. Um, what are some tips that you could provide of how to counter misinformation in these rumors? You know, how do you respond to these? Yeah, so I think um, a couple of first tips are very simply like, you want to make sure that you're understanding the context in the community first. So go in with very open ended qualitative questions, um, make sure that you're addressing and accessing a whole swath of the population in which you're working. So you're accessing women, you're accessing youth, you're accessing um, disabled, you're accessing all different ethnic groups within a community, you're accessing uh, power holders and not power holders, you know, you're talking to everybody so that you really understand what the dynamics are within that community and you're not making assumptions about the needs or about the motivations behind potential rumors and misinformation that, or, or disinformation that's being spread. Um, I think it's then you also really want to identify strong partners that are contextually relevant and know the context. So you can work with local fact checking organizations, you can work with local health and humanitarian organizations, and also very importantly, local media, um, because they're also very tied into community dynamics and community influencers, um, so that you understand, you know, who does the community trust, which voices are they listening to, um, which voices are not being heard or represented. Uh, and so then you can kind of understand some of those dynamics that are leading to the unhealthy information ecosystem that is creating the rumors and the mis and disinformation. So it sounds like, I, th I think a lot of people think that they can sit and get this information at their computer, but you can't, you have to get out and talk to people. Yeah, yeah. Ex and in a very targeted <laughs> way. Yes. Yeah, I, I do think there's, well, and there's two sides to the coin, right? Like we're seeing huge leaps forward in the ability to use like social media listening tools and um, sentiment analysis and like all of, you know, the machine learning aspects and some of the really exciting 
technology pieces that we're seeing come <laughs> before. And, and we're certainly experimenting with those and using those. Um, but particularly in non, non-Western cultures where you're working in minority languages, those tools tend to work less well. Um, and so you have to make sure that if you're gathering that type of quantitative um, information, you're also ground truthing it with very, very strong qualitative data gathered from the people that are in, you know, experiencing the crisis that are actually on the ground. Um, and then those two tools together can become incredibly powerful. Thank you. Can you, can you talk, uh, I'm sorry, can you talk a little bit about how um, when you plug in on the ground, and I think that this is Mary's, Mary's uh, touching upon this, is, is that your relationship, it's, it's, not just, it's not just the information. So let's say like Congo, right? You've got a peacekeeping mm -hmm. on the ground, you've got a, 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 you know, basically you've got a big integrated mission on the ground with these different elements to it and huge humanitarian footprint and this international military presence. And then you have the government and then you have all of these different armed actors that don't necessarily get along. <laughs> so information, the, the, the ecosystem is very different in each of these environments. How do you plug in to these different elements for information? Because it's not just about having a report that's got the quality. It's <laughs> It's, it's, it's much more than that. So how does that work, that, that, that part of your operation and capacity building? Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it's very contextually specific. So if we're entering a brand new context that we've never been in, the first step we'll do is of course link up with our local, you know, with potential media actors or partners that we have on the ground and similarly with health and humanitarian uh, actors. So we'll link in with the cluster system and the coordination mechanisms that are usually already in place there. Um, and then we will basically drill down as much as we need to via local uh, partners that have been vetted and checked um, to get to the actual community that we're trying to work in. Um, some, in some cases where we've been present for a while, we already have longstanding partnerships and so we're able to leverage those. Um, and then as we're staffing up our teams, we make sure to make, to build a very diverse team that includes a large portion of local um, national staff that speak the, the languages of the groups we're trying to work in that are already very well connected within those various communities. And so we really try to leverage the people themselves and, and make sure that we're empowering them versus us trying to come in and do, you know, some magical program that fixes everything. <laughs> we were talking about influencers and the effect uh, of um, of information on people and how they gather information, how they how they believe it, and when people get misinformation like this, you know, how do you change their minds? How can you build that trust to get them to understand what is right and what is false? Mm -hmm. That I think is one of the most challenging questions, honestly, and I think it's a nut that we're always trying to crack, right? And it depends on what. It largely depends on how deeply seated those those rumors and mis and disinformation are in existing conflicts or existing beliefs um, within communities, uh, as well as how weak is the actual information that's being provided. So is there any good information being provided or are these people having to operate in a completely in, in, information poor um, place, in which case they'll hold more strongly to a lot of the rumors and mis and, mis and disinformation that are that are traveling. Um, so I think this involves a lot of community mediation. It involves working very closely with community leaders and influencers um, because those are often the voices that are heard and trusted. And so, um, but again, starting with understanding what the motivations are and the challenges are within that community so that we can try to build the trust within the community uh, so that they do in fact believe us when we, when we give them good information. Um, and that's, that's not easy, you know, that involves us listening to complaints, that involves us showing that when we hear a complaint, we will try to make a change. Um, so it's, it's remaining accountable to the people that we're trying to serve. And that very often means us building a bridge between local communities and then the health and humanitarian actors or whoever the, the, the stakeholders are in that particular context to ensure that um, that challenges are being heard and addressed because if they're not, then there's no reason that people will start to believe accurate information really. <laughs> Do you have in, 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 in these relationships and um, just because, you know, some of the things with the, the healthcare workers that have been targeted and killed and, and some of these misinformation, there's stuff with the humanitarian actors in terms of negotiations with state and non-state actors and engagement. So, so some, you know, some of these governments are actually actively 
putting information out. There's there, and then you've got the people that are the human smugglers, and they're doing this for their economy, right? They're their profits, right? Uh, and then you've got uh, folks like some of these terror groups that are, you know, creating these narratives that are actually putting people on the on the ground, their lives in danger. So it's it's very like you know Central African Republic or Congo, you're talking about dozens of armed groups that have different control over different territories. And do you see different narratives in these areas? And and we're seeing this everywhere. This is just this is one context that's not it's it's outside what we're working. In. So, but it applies to many things that are happening in the world right now. When you have such divisiveness and you have people with competing narratives of disinformation for uh, competing purposes. How, you, you, you talked about mediation and Mary brought up trust, which is, it anchors a lot of, when we're talking about these disin, we're in these disinformation series, it's consistently come up with the experts. They're like, we have all this great technology. We've got all this, this approaches. We've got all this ways of processing information, understanding what's fake, what's deep fake and how things have been manipulated. But it's that trust and that and that's and it's, it's how people receive information, right? We, we, we kind of hear what we want to hear. So this cognitive bias that we have in all of this. So when you are on the ground in this stakeholder building and this trust, uh, what do you see as the, as the way ahead? And is there any success stories where you've got such a divided environment because you guys are in some, some complex operational settings? Uh, how does this work? And, and is there any nuggets of information you can share with the rest of the world on, on how <laughs> make some progress in this area. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, as you can see, there's not a magic pill that solves. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't nope. have that secret of a sauce. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it, it, and it's gonna sound like a broken record, but it's really identifying who's already trusted in a community yeah. um, and then building trust with that person or that group. Um, and then I also do think that there is a question always to be asked, which is, are we the right people to be on the ground doing that activity? Or is there a better way for us to, to, to change the dynamics? Um, because very often we're not the right, you know, we shouldn't be boots on the ground. We should be helping to empower the voices that often already exist um, and helping to build their voices to be stronger and to have stronger platforms and also to be safer and know how to protect themselves. And so we do have many situations that we work in um, where we are working with local partners that have already done a lot of the advocacy work and are working on the trust building. And so we will help build their capacity and give them the tools and resources necessary to continue their work. Um, this happens very often with like women's journalism networks and women's radio networks and, and, and areas like that that we really try to focus on. So I think number one, trying to understand to the best of our ability, what are the, what are the dynamics that are causing the dangerous situations on the ground in the first place? What is a true security assessment of the play, of the context? You know, should we be there? And if not, how can we still help to, um, to build up the voices that are actually promoting good information, trust, and, and building those relationships with the community and with the marginalized groups that we're, we're really trying to empower? One question, and this isn't this isn't something, but this is part of the, the kind of the, the conversation when we think about it. And then reporters without borders, and sort of the annual report, uh, and, and what we were talking about is the civil society space. The space for media is is shrinking, and a lot of folks are shutting down. And then one of these uh, one of the, the other series that we had, one of our experts that spoke, uh, I think it was Michelle Betts, said the the that the, the the disinformation campaigns in the media from foreign sources has actually overwhelmed in some local markets. What the local media is so that the power of this this type of uh, disinformation or manipulation of information or narrative controlling the narrative is an incredibly global secure incredible global security issue but as a as an international ngo you guys are dependent on uh, the government giving you access to actually operate on the ground and what reporters without borders is saying things are more restrictive and you're seeing this trend towards the, the operational environment is getting more and more uh, closed off. Is this something that you're seeing in internews as well? Or do you used to have access in certain countries that it, and now your footprint is, is, sh is shrinking or are you finding you're still able to navigate and work because of the work you're doing? It, it, it's, it's not as, uh, as, as restrictive. Uh, it's an interesting question because I think in some areas we're seeing more closure and then in other areas we're seeing an opening up happening. So it's kind of a waxing and a waning. Um, and I do think that 
particularly in, in uh, human, the humanitarian world, having governments not want humanitarian sector there happens happens at times and so like having a closing you know a closing environment and then an opening one is something that we've seen happen um throughout throughout aid history i think it's about kind of finding those avenues even in even in spaces that are close to us how can we still make sure that we're supporting the actors that are already operating on the ground um and do it in a way that doesn't endanger them and doesn't endanger us um and so, yeah, again, being really honest with ourselves about what is the actual intervention that's required in that particular place and, and, then, um, and then implementing it, you know, staying true to it and providing support to the, to the actors on the ground that are really going to do the actual work at the end of the day. I was going to ask, so for some of our alumni that are working in this area, do you have any resources that you would recommend to them as far as information tools, toolkits that they can look at to help build a better information ecosystem? Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, so we have the rumor tracking methodology that, uh, that you guys brought up earlier. It's actually, mm -hmm. it's pretty robust. It's three parts. It discusses you know, how do you understand the context? What types of um, approaches should you take? And uh, and then an actual how-to guide with toolkits. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it has it has the survey tools, it has the templates, it has the the, the programmatic checklists, staffing. Um, so it really is the kind of like rumor tracking in a box that you'd be hoping for. Um, so we have that on our website, and then we also do have uh, a live kind of page of just about our COVID-19 resources that are designed specifically for um, media actors working in a variety of contexts. So it has a lot of the lessons learned that we're actually like learning right now as we're working within this context. Um, and so that has new articles on it uh, all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm always looking back at the new stuff that's getting posted there. So that is a very active page as well. One of the things that there's the resources, but also um, since you guys, you, you, you did, and I, I was before we started, uh, I was talking a little bit about the H2H project from February to May, where you guys were doing kind of an analysis of the COVID response and the disinformation uh, with Translators Without Borders and BBC Media and, and this, and, and you have that report on your, your website as well. Um, the going forward and the fact that this, 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 this challenge that you guys are really the experts in, and you guys, and then you've got 35 years of experience in this, um, it's growing exponentially. And, and, and you're, you guys really are the folks that are gonna have insight into uh, what do you see the way ahead and who are key partners that need to be brought to the table on this that uh, we need to get better uh, at working together. Um, uh, who are the important stakeholders? If somebody's trying to do this in their, in their country, who do they need to bring together uh, to building that trust and start uh, building that capacity because you, you've got the toolkit, but who needs to be aware of the toolkit and who needs to come together to make that happen? Yeah, um, I, I think that's a multi-leveled question. So I think there's what happens on the ground and then I think there's what's the what is the global response need to look like. Um, the latter, well, both of them bringing their own complexities. <laughs> uh, at, at the local level, um, I mean, I think that's an area that we have a bit more experience in we as an industry we as interviews and then also we as an industry um you know it's trying to build the bridges between the the various actors that are there so health humanitarian stakeholders as well as the media organizations government as appropriate um and then uh and then the people themselves so making sure that all the, the wide swath of populations in a context have voice and have access to information that's contextually relevant to them um, and a way to voice their needs and concerns. And so it's helping them to understand and build that kind of network um, between themselves. So with one of the first things that we'll really start to do in a humanitarian action in particular is to build networks between journalists, between each other, but then also <laughs> across, uh, across the, the board with uh, health and humanitarian and actors as well. And that's then sustainable beyond our response. So when we leave, those networks continue um, and that communication continues ideally. Um, and so we really do try to build those local networks from the start and make them strong and open and, and have lots of room for dialogue between those various stakeholders and actors to begin working on the issues themselves um, and taking those forward. Um, so I think that's one thing that we really focus on strongly at the local level. Um, 
I mean, I think at the global level, it's a very similar <laughs> dynamic. We have a lot of stakeholders that are working on this issue, but in silos. So I know, for example, when I started um, diving into this uh, a couple of years ago, um, we were focusing on it with a peace and conflict lens, and there were very specific organizations that were working on this, um, but they weren't necessarily talking to just general humanitarian actors. Um, academia was doing its own thing. Uh, government information security actors were doing their own work, and it was uh, a whole different vocabulary for each set of stakeholders is being developed actively. <laughs> so we might be saying the same things, but we're using completely different words. Um, even down to just the literal word level. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of great work happening, but are we talking to each other about it? I don't, I don't think as much as we should. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of reinventing of the wheel uh, that's happening versus building on learning. Um, I also think particularly at the global level, we need to make sure that there are diverse voices, particularly including technology companies um, in a collaborative way uh, to think about how these platforms are being used um, for for these di these various um, mis and disinformation dynamics and what should be or could be changed. Um, it's a lot more complicated than just changing a couple of algorithms and suddenly the platform the platforms are fixed. Um, <laughs> and it's you know it gets it gets into some very difficult questions about freedom of speech and that changes according to yeah. the country that you're working in um, and the different populations. And so I think that there needs to be some room for that really difficult dialogue to happen across sectors and across countries or um, yeah, regions. Be interesting to see with how, how quickly everything's moving and how much this is becoming a part of this global environment and it's dominating and it's in, in news stories, um, whether this actually pushes these things to happen and, and this, these stakeholders to come together and, and really kind of uh, work this issue and come up with a, a way ahead that can be applied to other global challenges. Um, yeah. yeah, I think something you just said made me, you know, this is going to be a slow process and, and recognizing that these emergencies, they pop up, they're popping up now, you know, they're happening now. And, uh, and so I think another thing that we're really focusing on on the ground as well is digital literacy and digital awareness, um, particularly with groups that are just coming into the digital world. So we're trying to understand what what is a digitally resilient person look like? You know, how, what is a person who can recognize mis and disinformation and rumors and then know what to do about it look like? Um, and so a lot of that, you know, we're kind of looking into those dynamics as well so that we can help local populations to, to be resilient to those things as they come along because we know that we will not be ahead of the issue anytime soon. So, it, you know, individuals need to be able to also protect themselves and their communities to the degree possible. That's an, that's an incredible point in terms of the future and in, in the amount, the percentage of population, particularly in the vulnerable populations, you know, the, the amount that are youth and the lack of access to education and how vulnerable they are to a lot of these narratives, right? Um, so that's like where you hope that UNICEF as the global lead on education, uh, this starts to get integrated into uh, these operational environments where they are providing education is to be able to, uh, to create space for us to have a resilient future. Um, otherwise, we are not in good shape. Exactly. Yeah, digital literacy is something that is incredibly important and um, you know it's some things that needs to be done on all levels you know it needs to be done by the, the local librarians the teachers but also making sure that the companies are sharing information so people can understand what is good information what's bad information yeah, yeah. exactly and also what their rights are around that information yes. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, and everything, it, you know, this, this is, it's, it's, it's freaking like in the pandemic, arguably is, is, is the, the impact of it is far worse because of the disinformation that's around it. Um, and, and I think one of the, the, the big things, and, and Mary brought it up, and this is something that we're talking about is, you know, it gets down to the very human aspect of this and there are no it's a, it's a slow process and even government or bringing in a bunch of stakeholders that are used to being stovepipe and all this stuff that's always a nightmare slow process of trying to yeah. get information not to be a debbie downer about it but that's true <laughs> at this point yeah in life. but the other thing is there's no shortcuts to human trust either in these relationships right so that and that's a big part of this is that you 
information can be provided and it can be the highest quality, but if there's not that, that trust from where it's coming from, it, it's, it's not going to be effective. So there's, there's a lot of work to be done in the fact that you guys have had this presence for a long time. Um, it should be an incentive for people to come together and, and work within those networks of trust to try to get the information out and not reinvent the wheel. It, it's how do we put, how we put folks like you in touch with other people that are in our alumni network on the ground so that uh, we, can, we can improve the situation and we can and start getting there. And then you know, UNICEF can figure out with Global Cluster Lead on Education how they to teach all these young folks. Oh, how, how they're going to tackle that easy problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is just going to take this, this, this bite right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of internews that in the work that you do it continues. It's, it's, it's increasing. It's more important by the day, uh, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And um, I hope that we can keep talking to each other. And I hope that in the future, we're able to connect you with some of our alumni network to do some educational activities and, and hopefully get some folks from Internews to come through our courses once this COVID and we start doing the, the physical presence because we do, we bring together this amazing group of people from all walks of life and from all different uh, aspects of society. And it's, it's really just coming together to figure out how do we, how do we handle these big security issues and, and really not not focus on the stovepipe, but look at from different lens. What can we bring to the get table to make a better tomorrow? And it's it's a really tremendous process and, and program. And it'd be great to have folks like Internews in the room uh, and part of our Absolutely. fellow alumni. Yeah, yeah, we'd be happy to join. <laughs> awesome, awesome, and I'd be happy to go check out Tennessee pretty soon. But <laughs> <Perfect>. <laughs> if you guys got some great music. <laughs> so, <Yes>, we do. <laughs> um, Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Megan, and uh, we will be in touch.